everyone for joining the session uh, on the private sector's role in getting to net zero. Uh, a very pertinent and timely discussion uh, in the current context. Um, just to share some statistics to start off, uh, you know, as of March 2021, uh, the world's largest 400 public companies representing annual sales of nearly $14 trillion have committed to reaching net zero emissions. In India alone, uh, about 61 companies have signed up to science-based targets initiative. Uh, given this broader context, uh, it becomes very important to understand how some of these pathways to net zero emissions are being envisioned by the private sector organizations. What are the critical challenges that the private sector is facing in achieving net zero goals? And it's also important to understand the ecosystem support that uh, private sector requires to make net zero a reality. So today we have uh, with us both uh, private sector organizations uh, in the panel uh, who have taken up some of these commitments. And we also have ecosystem players who are supporting innovations that can help the private sector on their journey to net zero. So thank you to all the speakers. I'll, I'll take a quick minute to you know, briefly introduce the speakers and the moderator for the session today. Uh, my name is Prachi. I uh, will be hosting the session and uh, will be helping you with any logistical issues that you have. I represent IntelliCap and I have with me Venkat, uh, who is the director uh, at IntelliCap for Circular Apparel Innovation Factory, uh, which is also called CAF. CAF is a co-creation and collaboration platform within IntelliCap, uh, which was created to develop a circular economy in the clothing and textile industry. So Venkat uh, will be moderating the session. And uh, we have a great uh, list of panelists with us today uh, who will be sharing their insights with us. We have Ms. Sharika, who's the Director of Environmental Sustainability at Mass Holdings. We have Ms. Prabha Narsimhan, Executive Director at Hindustan Unilever Limited. We have Mr. Rajneesh Rai, who is the General Manager Environmental Sustainability at uh, Shahi Exports. And we also have Mr. Sandeep Tandon, who brings in an ecosystem perspective in this conversation as a national project manager, uh, low carbon technology deployment and global clean tech innovation projects at UNIDO. So with this, I uh, will hand over the stage to Venkat to uh, moderate the discussion and also to set the broader context and agenda for the session. Over to you, Venkat. And thanks to all the speakers again and all uh, you know, the audience for joining. Thank you so much, uh, Prachi, and uh, a very warm welcome to all the panel panelists. Uh, such a pleasure to see you all again, and uh, thank you for making the time to join us. Uh, it's such an important conversation, right, for any of us, for all of us, uh, irrespective of which sectors and which organizations we're representing. Um, but I think one thing is very clear that you are here because your organizations have set very clear intent and uh, follow through action to really make credible progress towards net zero emissions. Uh, Prach has already spoken about the big numbers. Um, there's no denying the fact that the climate change and the climate crisis is the definitive crisis that we all face um, as individuals, as communities, as organizations, as sectors, and as a planet as a whole. Um, there was a very interesting um, um, point that one of the speakers in an earlier con uh, session today uh, was talking about from our textiles, apparel, and fashion industry. And uh, Prabha, bear with me as I give a fashion uh, reference. Uh, but we, of course, know that fashion industry is one of the probably the top three most polluting industries in the world. Um, some might argue it's number four, but I don't see the difference. Um, if you consider the raw material input, which is such a critical contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions and the carbon footprint of the global fashion industry, there are three fundamental sources for the raw material. We get it from agriculture, we get it from food in the form of leather, or we get it from the petroleum industry. So if you consider not just the fashion industry as a whole, but the source, the three big sources of raw material input for the industry, they themselves have such a significant carbon footprint that it's difficult to imagine us across different sectors or within any specific sector to make a tangible progress towards carbon or reducing our carbon footprint if we do not work across the value chain, but also not work 
within and across different sectors, right? So we speak about how circular economy is definitely one of the uh, credible pathways that organizations can adopt to uh, address their uh, GHG emissions or the carbon footprint. Um, but true circularity, as we always speak about, is how it happens at the intersection of two different sectors, right? And fashion is one of those examples. And so would be the case for uh, the FMCG sector as well, Prabha, I would reckon. Um, now, we just want to look at this particular session in three broad segments. Um, the key idea of having these organizations who have shown true commitment towards addressing or getting onto the net zero pathways and targets and um, showing true uh, uh, action to make credible progress is that the audiences, the organizations that you're representing can actually learn from their own experience, right? So we'll understand how each of these organizations and each of these speakers have started on their net zero journey. What are some of the challenges that they face and how they've addressed those challenges? More importantly, how do they get buy-in from their internal stakeholders, but also buy-in from across their value chain partners? And the third segment is where we will actually understand how technologies and innovations and solutions can really help uh, any of these organizations or any organization that you're part of um, in getting your net zero uh, strategy and roadmap started, but also to make progress on it, right? So uh, let's jump into the conversation straight away. And uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, you wouldn't mind if I start with the ladies uh, in the house. Uh, so, uh, Prava, let me start with you, uh, if I may. Um, we obviously know uh, the clear intent and the ambitious targets that Unilever has set. And the intent has been backed with a very strong uh, follow through and action. Um, would love to understand from you on what are the key pillars of Unilever's net zero strategy? Um, and what are some of those areas where, or some of those ways in which you got started on your net zero roadmap? Thanks very much, uh, Venkat and Prachi, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, I must confess that I'm quite new to this entire space and, and learning every day, but uh, absolutely a privilege to be among such a and uh, such an awesome panel of speakers. Uh, firstly, Venkat, before I answer your question, I want to maybe just take a step back on the Unilever philosophy itself mm -hmm. uh, and just talk about it for a bit because the foundation of the entire company has actually been the idea of you do well when you do good. Uh, and with that came from the entire Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, uh, which we've been now following for uh, well over a, a decade at least. Uh, and uh, if we go back to the roots of the company, way back to, to William Lever, uh, you know, creating the sunlight soap to take on a pandemic not similar to the to the one that we uh, we are all living through currently, or the fact that you know we created a healthy alternative to butter, our roots really lie in the whole idea of sustainability. And with this, we have created a series of time-bound targets uh, and potentially. If I may, at the cost of sounding like we are supremely ahead of the curve, I do think you know, we're going to be earlier, uh, earliest people to commit uh, to these targets. And as we look back at the last decade of the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, I think uh, we are realizing that there is value to doing this. And more importantly, I think there isn't an option uh, but to do this. And, and that brings me really to, to your question, uh, which is, you know, what are we doing and what have we committed to? And, What's our roadmap? So really, there are five things uh, that I want to talk about uh, in terms of our commitments and what we're thinking about. The first one uh, is for us to achieve a deforestation-free supply chain by 2023. Uh, that target is almost imminent and upon us. And you know, a huge amount of work has actually gone into this, and we have a reasonable line of sight of it. Of course, the next one is net zero carbon emissions from all our products cradle to shelf by 2039. Uh, quite a stretching commitment uh, in, in within the next decade. We want to have the greenhouse gas impact of our products across their life cycle by, by 2030 and have all of our product formulations biodegradable by, by the same time. And in this, there is, of course, a plastic target as well that we want to have our use of virgin plastic uh, packaging and help and collect more plastic than we sell. And actually, as far as Hindustan Unilever is concerned, we will already be net negative plastic users for the year 2021, collecting more plastic 
uh, than we put into uh, to the environment, which is we think quite a quite a benchmark for, for us and given the scale of our our company. And and of course, by 2025, we want to make sure that we are reusable, recyclable, or compostable, uh, and increase the the use of recycled plastic. So these are really what we are saying. If I can just maybe even funnel it to the business that I work in, which is the home care business, uh, and we do have targets across the various businesses, the home care business has taken perhaps the most, and I hope that we'll get a chance to get input on it, what we call clean future, the most aggressive target of making sure that we will create superior, sustainable, and affordable products by eliminating all fossil fuels uh, or all products that emanate from fuels. Uh, by 2030, so within the next decade, uh, and that's really the the space in which we we want to operate. So just a, a headline introduction. Fantastic, uh, Prabha. Those are very inspiring uh, statistics, and of yeah. course, uh, each of those pillars that you identified uh, speak of the intent and the commitment uh, on behalf of Unilever. So thank you so much, and I'll I'll circle back to you. But I just wanted to get at least the first round of. Um, high level inputs uh, and remarks from each of the speakers on uh, how their organization's uh, net zero strategy and roadmap looks like. So if I could not jump to Rajneesh, um, and if I could direct the question to you and understand uh, from a Shahi Exports point of view, um, talk to us about uh, what your net zero strategy and your roadmap looks like, and what are some of the key pillars um, of this roadmap uh, for Shahi Exports? Thank you, Vinkat. Uh... Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, CIF, uh, for calling us Shahi. Even though, even though we are uh, we are presenting Shahi at many of the multi brands uh, seminars, trainings, and sharing the best practices. You know, the Shahi Sports is involved with the textile industry, and we are uh, we are making the fabrics and making the garments. We are we are having almost uh, more than fifty factories around three mills. Two are two are woven and one is knits. So uh, our our main components of energy, if we talk about the net zero, is the thermal and uh, electrical. In the in uh, in electrical, at present, our seventy three percent of our uh, energy is the renewable energy. Uh, it is uh, we have already, uh, we have achieved this with our uh, aggressive uh, roadmap and aggressive vision of our top management, and we had put at uh, eighty four megawatt of uh, uh, solar plant in Karnataka that is situated in uh, Bidar and 32 in 32 megawatt in uh, Bellary. So approx 13 uh, 13.5 crore units we are generating per annum and that is being feeded into our factories. So 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 the main components of this electricity around 73 percent we are we are we are uh, utilizing as a renewable energy. And if we talk about if we talk about the uh, emission uh, like like uh, reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emission, it is around. Uh, if we talk about uh, scope two, it is uh, it is around uh, sixty three percent of reduction. If you take the baseline of sixteen seventy, so we are we are trying hard to 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 uh, to adopt the renewable energy. And on the other hand, if we talk about the thermal energy. That is through the boiler, you know, you know, in textile industry, we need we need to have the steam. So mainly the boiler fuels. We are uh, we are uh, we are converting our coal-based boiler into the biomass, into the into the PNG LPG, based on the states, based on the uh, there are a lot of regulation between the states and all these things. So we need uh, we are we are moving ahead into this direction with respect to the thermal energy. And and if we talk about if we talk about the target. Uh, Shahi is in 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 the process to 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 add more uh, 40 megawatt of uh, solar uh, solar plant in 2022. So our target is till 2025 will be the 100 percent renewable energy, uh, 100 percent electrical renewable energy. And 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 uh, on the other hand, we are we are also working on the thermal energy, uh, the, the way the way adoption of the fossil uh, uh, conversion of the fossil fuel. To the biomass, and 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 somewhere we have the availability of the PNG and LPG, and and the achievements which we which we had achieved recently, 
like we had been awarded by the Walmart as a giga guru, gigaton. They have the very ambitious target of to produce one gigaton till 20, uh, 23rd. So we are the giga guru. And, and recently we have, uh, we have been awarded by the Cradle to Cradle, that is gold certification uh, by the C2C Institute. And uh, we are also adding more and more factories into the science-based targets. And uh, along with that, we are, we are part of HKRITA, Hong Kong Research Institute Textile Association, uh, uh, Textile Apparel Association. So there, there, there we, are, we are part of this uh, cellulose powder recovered from the recycled cotton polyester blends into a super absorbent polymer, that is a SAP. It is hydrothermal technology to recycle cotton and polyester blends. It helps in uh, recovering polyester fibers and converting cotton into the cellulose powder. So SAP application is actually actually yielding yielding the uh, enhancing the cotton quality and uh, and uh, and uh, improve the water retention and soil moisture. There are a lot, lot of R and we are which we are doing into the textile in industry with respect to the sustainable material and sustainable process. So this is this is a very quick uh, about our this net net zero key components. Along with that, we are we are also um, uh, applying the reduce, reuse, and recycle. So our 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 strategy is like that uh, to improve in two ways. One is the energy efficiency, and another one is the adoption of the renewable energy. In, in, in energy efficiency, we are we are changing our machines for the latest technology. So our baseline is going down. Of, uh, if we talk about the energy consumption, and in the uh, second way, we are we are ad adopting the renewable energy. So in both the ways, we are able to we are able to uh, we are able to pop up this uh, net zero uh, emissions towards uh, towards the target. You know, you know, in textile industry, it's it's very difficult uh, if you talk about the thermal energy. Absolutely. So that's that's it, uh, Mr. Venkat, from my side about your. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rajneeshan. Of course, uh, there's a lot of credible work that Shai Exports has been doing, um, and you and as you rightly mentioned. Um, uh, our efforts to decarbonize, um, uh, um, um, you know, get onto the decarbonization pathway and kind of make credible progress there has to go way beyond than just conversion to renewable energy sources. So um, glad to hear the efforts that Chai is making on going beyond and looking at uh, the other business models as well to be able to uh, reduce the GHG emissions. Um, I'll, I'll circle back to you, Rajneesh, but just want to get in some quick remarks from the other speakers as well as we warm up. Uh, Sharika, if I may come to you now, um, and one of the conversations or one of the many points that uh, gets covered in, in, in every conversation that we've had over the last year uh, is the incredible work that Mass Holdings has been doing out of Sri Lanka. Um, but while we would love to understand what your overall net zero strategy and roadmap looks like and what are some of the key pillars, um, I would definitely be keen for the audience to understand on how you're looking at net zero, not just as a mutually exclusive uh, element of mass holdings operations, but how you work very closely with the community. So uh, over to you, Sharika. Sure, thanks, um, Vankat. This is definitely something that, um, you know, when we're working towards the path for, for net zero, it's such a complicated uh, area. So we, we where this entered our consciousness actually right about 2010 where we started working on it. And I see so many interesting things that Prabha and uh, Rajnish also talked about that we have in common. So if we go back to what we'd like, what we sort of started in 2010, we also realized that we had fossil fuel running thermal energy back, back then. And the stage in which we wanted to move it, we've now moved it all into biomass. And now looking in terms of how do we convert from biomass to climate neutral biomass. So there's lots of interesting stories uh, that we all have in common. Um, so, I mean, if we talk about what we'd like to do in terms of uh, our organization, how we plan to achieve it, um, it's been a, a tough um, way to put the entire strategy together. So to start with, um, I mean, we, we've sort of established some targets internally. We've decided that while we looked at many options, sort of looking at renewable energy, investing in renewable energy, we had some challenges, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. But our, our sort of main uh, decision right now was that we will also work with science-based targets. 
um, and using 2019 as a baseline. And we have now set up to uh, commit to that 25% absolute reduction by 2025. Um, I think that is something that is absolutely essential for everyone to put go forward. Um, I mean, I think there are some challenges, et cetera, that we can talk about, but MAS has worked uh, in many aspects, not just directly looking at emissions, but also very strongly in the space of biodiversity. We've uh, made some commitments that we started in about 2013, where we wanted to make sure that 100 times the space we occupy um, would be restored. And we're looking at about 25,000 acres of forest that we can have within Sri Lanka. That, um, there, so that's a huge effort that we're making around that area, um, as well as we're working closely along um, on some very interesting uh, areas about waste collection and looking at how we can do circular products and keep things within the, the island as well to reduce the footprint. For example, a recent project we had was we are working to capture the floating debris that is floating in our canals. Um, how do we collect that and convert the PET that is recyclable back into yarn and back into fabric? But even the dyeing process, we are innovating as we go ahead where we're looking at dyeing it at the pellet level or the yarn level, so as to reduce the amount of um, energy transport, et cetera. So there are a lot of broad projects. I think it's, it's, I don't want to get into too much detail, but if there's anything specific you'd like me to, to talk about, I'd be happy to do that as we go along. Fantastic. Um, no, that's good for now, Sharika, and we'll definitely circle back to you for um, further details on those projects that you were indicating. Um, uh, Sandeep, uh, thank you so much for waiting in, and I would love to get your inputs on um, the program that you lead at Uni, uh, Unido, the FLCDD program, and uh, would be good for the audiences to understand the program, the contours of it, and how these innovators uh, that come through the uh, program and how they could actually help the private sector in um, achieving the net zero uh, emission targets. Uh, first of all, Venkat, thank you very much uh, for this invitation, and it's a privilege uh, to speak at the you know, Central Forum, you know, uh, as we did in the past. Uh, and it's a good opportunity to connect with the you know, industry people. Uh, if you could just, you know, uh, sorry for an interruption, I have to send somebody at the door. I'll join back. No problem, Sandeep. Please go ahead. No problem. That's par for the course for uh, remote working and connecting virtually. So do bear with us. Um, I just want to have Sandeep's remarks and then before we can continue the conversation with uh, all of you. Um, but of course, one of the things that I would love for each of you to kind of think about, uh, Sandeep, thank you for coming in. Sorry, uh, we could. Uh, yes. Uh, no Let problem. me you know, take a step back uh, before you know, getting into the program. Uh, you know, just to you know, uh, you know, brief about the organization that I represent. I with I you know, leading a program at the uh, you know, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, based in New Delhi, and this is one of the specialized agency of the United Nations that focuses on industrial uh, you know, development across the you know, emerging economies and the developing countries, and uh, key motto being you know promoting inclusive and sustainable development. Uh, UNIDO has you know, several programs uh, on you know, energy related and building the capacity in industries, also works in the area of chemical, uh, being one of the UN agencies that help the you know, countries uh, to you know, meet their international commitment on uh, various uh, treaties, international treaties, either on climate change or chemical phase out. Uh, so there's a Stockholm Convention, where you know, several hazardous chemicals have been you know, identified and uh, UNIDO has been you know, working on you know, uh, phasing out of those chemical, chemicals and you know, that kind of work is also being done in India. Um, so coming to the project uh, program, uh, UNIDO is uh, you know, working in India on promoting uh, uh, you know, novel projects on renewable energy and energy efficiency in industries. And, uh, and the next step uh, that we need to took uh, as a part of uh, you know uh, being one of the implementing agencies for uh, climate change mitigation program was to 
look at the area of you know climate change and energy efficiency uh, and start identifying the you know, innovative technologies so that program started in 2010 uh, in the, the climate change conference in south africa and you know a pilot uh, project was done across nine countries uh, it's called global detect innovation program and india was one of the countries and four areas were identified uh, energy efficiency uh, renewable energy uh, water efficiency and uh, waste reduction and this program ran for four years i was you know uh, closely associated with that leading that program and we came across very very interesting you know startup say in india that gave us the confidence that you know there is in this you know uh, uh, landscape also which is you know not very you know well known you know there are you know entrepreneurs working you know right from the coming out of the technical institute iits developing you know new technology and they are willing to you know go forward and take those innovation out in the market so as a the follow on to that uh, unit to develop another you know larger program uh, which is the program that i am currently leading it's called the facility for low carbon technology deployment so uh, it takes the you know next step is when you have you know, identified the innovative you know, energy efficient technologies these become the you know the uh, stepping stone for going to you know targets for you know low carbon you know technologies and can eventually you know, the goal towards the net zero so uh the first step is towards you know going for energy efficiency uh the conventional technologies that are out uh, there in the market uh, those are available uh, what we have in the program is we uh, run the innovation challenge and i think uh, uh, we can uh, discuss that if you want uh we can towards later but uh, the idea here is to identify the uh, technology gaps for which there is no product available in the market and run the innovation challenge and we have been successful in identifying several you know innovations on you know for the industrial and commercial sector you know benefit and the project is supporting them for technology validation so we reach out to the industry find out uh, whether you know they have an appetite they are willing for trying out these innovative technologies and you know this help uh, for you know those technology validation process which is very very uh, important step when you have to take these innovations for commercialization so in the textile sector uh, since we are talking uh, you know all the uh, we have few people as we discussed with you you know that we have got uh, now uh, you know innovation that is being currently you know commissioned you know four days back uh, in one of the leading you know textile industry for uh you know capturing the heat from the low grade waste heat from the dyeing and sewing and we'll have more results uh you know towards the end of the month which uh, will you know, eventually put in the public domain so uh we got uh, you know uh, under this program that we have been running for the last 3 to 4 years we got about you know 60 winners in the innovation challenge and you know we're providing about 3 million dollars or 20 crore worth of financial support to you know test and validate these innovation so that the industry gets a confidence that this solution works and you know uh, with the benefit it can be provided so we you kind know, of strongly believe these would be the the pathways for the industry to meet their goals uh, towards you know uh, the low carbon you know which would then eventually help them to go forward to the net zero goals perfect sandeep thank you uh, if i heard you well uh, you were referring to promethean energy yes yes yeah so their system got commissioned on mine you know just about you know three days four days back and uh, you know our team would be visiting uh, the plant uh, to you know do the you know validation yeah uh, very interesting you should mention that because uh, we actually showcased uh, promethean and we had ashwin in the session just before this one so Uh, yeah, so Promethean is a startup uh, from IIT Mumbai. Uh, yeah. Both the co-founders are, you know, alumnus of IIT Mumbai, and we have several of such, you know, you know startups uh, with you know good track record. Can you, in fact, uh, uh, Prabha mentioned about uh, looking at these, uh, you know, uh, packaging material. Just this year, we got, uh, you know, a startup uh, working on biodegradable plastics, and this, you know, startup is uh, still, you know, based out of incubator in. in a technical institute so those are the kind of you know uh, startup we are you know beginning to reach out so there is something that we are positioning 
ourselves or you know with the industry as well as the entrepreneur bringing the innovative technologies to the industry so that you know they would have certain comfort that the, even the selection has gone through a credible process and you know they would be willing to you know try out those innovations fantastic thank you so much for that context uh, sandeep and we will we'll come back and um, we'll delve a little bit more on how uh, critical the role that innovators and tech innovations and technologies and solutions can really help uh, the private sector uh, organizations as they make progress um, on on their uh, net zero journey. Um, Prabha, I would like to come back to you. And um, you were talking about the key pillars in Unilever's um, net zero strategy. And I believe one of the um, one of the big enablers for everyone at Unilever who's taken on and embraced this ambitious mission is the um, existence of the um, the climate and nature fund uh, as well as the clean future fund so would love for you to elaborate a little bit more on these two funds and how they actually help enable every single individual within unilever and within of course different business teams of course um, on making uh, progress towards net zero Thanks, Venkat. Uh, yeah, I'm going to start first with the Climate and Nature Fund, which is really a, a 1 billion euro fund that we've set aside uh, for the purpose of doing exactly that, which is um, ensuring that we uh, you know, create positive impact on, uh, on climate change and, and what we can to ensure that we are uh, regenerating nature. And I think I heard a comment on one of these other panels the other day, like while pandemics can have a vaccine, uh, our climate change certainly can't, and the only way is actually perhaps the, the hard way. But what I want to spend uh, a little bit of time on actually is the second part that you talked about, which is clean future, which is far more than actually a fund. Uh, clean future is actually the fundamental premise on which the entire home care business now sits, given as it is that our home care business is largely a, a laundry and household cleaning business. And as you would be aware, most of the source of our materials currently is from fossil fuels. And therefore, the commitment that we will move out of fossil fuels in entirety uh, by the end of this uh, this decade is really, I think, probably been the most energizing commitment uh, that, that we've made in, in a long time. And all of us are aware that materials are responsible for most emissions. And if I remember the numbers correctly and happy to be corrected, but but 45% of emissions come from fossil fuels. So we thought let's you know target the space that really is the one uh, that needs targeting. And the thought here is this idea of carbon rainbow. So if fossil fuels give us the black carbon, can we start moving into all of the other colors, which is the green from plant-based ingredients, the, the purple, and in that actually we have a fantastic partnership with a South India-based uh, company called Uticor and Alkali, who takes uh, carbon dioxide that's meant to go into the air, captures it, and then uses it in a process to produce soda ash, uh, which is obviously an ingredient that goes into our detergent and thereby creating purple carbon. And then we're doing some work on uh, gray as well. And of course, then there is the green-based sources, uh, which allow us to perhaps get blue carbon. So a full rainbow of carbon to substitute for uh, the black carbon that is currently the, the bulk of our business. And that's really the effort that we are making. I must confess uh, and would love comments either from the audience or, or from this panel or from yourself, actually, that we don't have all of the answers. So if you ask me now, fantastic, great ambition, uh, but how are you going to do it? Uh, I don't think we have all of the answers. And, and I think that's where we would love some collaboration and some ideas on what we could be doing. Because the one thing we are clear is that neither is the consumer going to compromise on her need for cleaning. And nor is she really going to be willing to pay uh, a premium for this. So we have to give her superior products that are affordable and yet sustainable. And I think in driving that triangle uh, is really where the challenge lies and would love some comments on it. Fantastic. Uh, Prabha, love the different colors and the rainbow of carbon uh, that you indicated. Um, you mentioned about uh, um, uh, you know that there's there's so much that we still don't know, and I guess the the beauty of the climate challenge uh, is that the answer lies in the unknown, and it's the pursuit of that unknown and trying to figure out the answers that makes uh, all our jobs uh, worth uh, doing what we do. So, uh, thank you so much for that, and uh, we'll probably come back to you and ask you a little bit more about um, how the how those two levers actually help drive 
and motivate the teams within Unilever and a little bit more. Um, Sharika, I want to come back to you. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've been uh, discussing uh, about MAS's efforts uh, is the uh, work around uh, restoring uh, the waterways and uh, restoring our ocean uh, ways, right? Um, and I know this has been such a significant part of the MAS efforts. Uh, and also you spoke about some of the future plans as well, and I won't give that away, but uh, talk to us a little bit more about how we, we obviously, sorry, let, let me take a step back. We obviously talk about carbon core benefits, right? So which is, we don't look at solutions which purely deliver on ecological benefits, but how could we look at solutions that also give core benefits in terms of socials, in terms of community, and in terms of economics as well. So I want to come back to you and delve a little bit more about your work um, with the community on helping restore the oceans um, across uh, in and around Sri Lanka for us? Sure. Um, so right now, um, if I was to step back a second, we did a lot of work uh, like everybody else uh, somewhere in sort of 2010, 12, trying to clean up the beaches. And we realized that the root cause of all of the waste was coming from inland. Sri Lanka has a, a huge canal network that was set up for transport years ago. And unfortunately it's transporting a significant amount of floating debris that really shouldn't be there. Um, so our efforts were based around creating a, a simple trap uh, that we would put at the canal mouth that before it went into the river. And we wanted to make sure that we catch all of the floating debris before it enters the sea. Um, so this was just innovated very simply. Um, it was within our organization and we trialed this out. But in order for it to be successful, we also wanted to make sure that there was a strong engagement with the community. So these, um, so we had to work with a lot of uh, stakeholders to pull something off like this. There was the uh, th there was obviously the community, but we also had the the Sri the people who own the canal, the SLLRDC, who have the canal. Then once the waste comes out, there's the the different waste management organizations that come in here. But what we decided to do was have a model where people who were unemployed and they were on a program in Sri Lanka called Samul, sort of our welfare program. So we work to actually pay for the welfare people to work four hours a day to help with this uh, work around um, helping to run a certain, uh, div to, to work on floaters and, and remove the, the waste from the canal traps, from the waste traps. So there's been um, an effort for us then to also try and organize the waste that's been collected uh, in a slightly more um, organized way than it normally would so that we can maximize the amount, the traceability and the recyclability of what we're capturing. Now, um, going back to, again, what Prabha was saying is that we definitely want to, we've opened IP this and we're working along with, um, with a lot of other FMCG companies or anybody who'd like to support to sponsor these. Um, and we've had a huge amount of uh, support from the community where all of the corporates are coming together, banks are coming together to work on this solution. So it's this kind of solution and collaboration that creates the scale that we need to make this successful. Um, so that's that's been a wonderful project for us. And just to add to it, 100% of the waste that is going into being collected uh, is now being able, we're able to purchase it for various parts of recycling. And we're having that part of um, uh, the recycling process also working much better. Lovely. Uh, thank you, Sharika, for that. Um, Rajesh, I want to come back to you and um, I want to pick up one of those aspects that you were mentioning in your uh, opening remarks. Um, and we know this, and I think uh, uh, Prabha was alluding to a little bit earlier as well, that materials become such a huge component of our carbon footprint. <clears throat> as I was indicating earlier about the the three biggest sources that come into the textiles and apparel industry from petroleum, food, and agriculture. Um, you mentioned about Shahi's focus on not just looking at the shift towards renewable energy to uh, get towards your net zero targets, but also look at um, alternate models like reuse and recycling. Uh, would love for you to elaborate a little bit more um, and probably give some insights for the audiences on how they can look at 
um, solutions beyond just uh, shift towards renewable energy on the net zero pathways? Uh, Mr. Vinkat, uh, you, you, if you talk about the textile uh, textile industry, and if, if you talk about our process about the sustainability, there are uh, there are almost three components. One is the sustainable process. In sustainable process, uh, if you talk about energy, water, chemical, waste, everything, uh, the processing should be sustainable. And the second one is the sustainable supply chain. In uh, if you see, if you see the fabric, fabric takes a lot of water, dyes, chemical, everything. Mm -hmm. So in Shahi, if we talk about uh, Shahi's, because have, we are having our own mills, and this mill is part of all the journey. So, so around 70 to 80 percent of the our fabric uh, comes over from uh, mill. So, and and if we talk about the water, water is most of our units is the general unit, general liquid discharge, and we are uh, more than 90 percent we are recycling the water and reusing it. If we talk about the chemical, that is minimum we are we are uh, we are using JTC level one certified chemical. If we if we talk about uh, if we talk about the waste management, uh, even waste water management, these are all part. You know now we are integrated with the HIG uh, HIG FM three point two. So we are integrated with everything everywhere we are setting the targets, and especially for the energy efficiency. We need to always look about the energy efficient machines in, in terms of where, where we can save even, even a little part of energy. Investing, investing some dollars or some rupees in an in a energy audit is not a big challenge. Just, just see how when a certified energy audit comes, see the factories, see the low hanging fruits, intermediate, uh, intermediate uh, investment or long term investment at least one has to start from the low hanging things that is low hanging things is the maintenance first leak uh, arresting the leakage I, either the steam or the air and the second one is the intermediate where you can change the um, sieving sieving motors from plus uh, to servo motor changing the led lights uh, adopting the vfd technologies so these are all things first you, we need to first we need to reduce the energy consumptions. If you if you take both the things together, reduction of energy, consumptions, and adoption of the renewable energy, then only we'll be able to achieve this net zero concept. Otherwise, otherwise, if you if you'll not look that energy consumptions and we just adopt the renewable energy, it will never happen. Because uh, uh, Prabha rightly said, we need to. Uh, no one wants to give the premium. Of, of, of any products we need to we need to we need to uh, fall between that price bracket also and no one wants to compromise with the quality so by seeing both the things 360 degrees we need to we need to achieve all those things and 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 that shahi is doing and this is the reason we had we had made a team like like you can understand 55 50 plus three factories uh, uh, of course 53 environmental responsible then we have the corporate environmental responsible. Then uh, now one of the in, uh, 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 now one of the environmental leader is uh, sitting in the board of directors. Then then these things we can we can start from the top, and then we can integrate in every factory. The best practices from one factory we are adopting in another factory, because we are we are uh, we are located in almost nine states. Every state is having different challenges. So in at least in one state, if you are having five factories, one factory is uh, doing good, that uh, then other factories can adopt all those things. So by seeing all those things and and summarizing the data, the data is very much important. The transparency of the data in the factory is very much important. Then will we be able to understand where we, where we can really hit or where we can improve ourselves? So this. These, uh, these are the components we, uh, which we are which we are really looking and this technology with a minimal environmental impact um, that is that that part we are adopting every day. if you see if you see in the washing machines like where we are doing the garment washing or in the mills energy efficient machines waterless washing uh, less chemical less load so uh, by seeing all those things then we are uh, taking decisions to adopt uh, the new technologies and machines. Thank you so much for that, uh, Rajesh. Uh, definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, I just want to see if we can take questions from the audiences on the run, so that instead of having to 
create dedicated time at the end of the session and there's always a good chance we run over time so i'm going to pick up some interesting questions uh, as we go along and i'll uh, pose it to uh, each one of you is that uh, fine with you yeah super so uh, this is a question that's uh, directed for all of you at all of you uh, and the question is in addition to your own initiatives for emission reductions what are you looking are you also looking at purchasing carbon credits for meeting your net zero targets so i'll just repeat it in addition to your own initiatives for emission reductions are you also looking at purchasing carbon credits for meeting your net zero targets um any, anyone it's an open question to uh, all of you uh, perhaps i could ask uh, sharika to take a shot at it first sure i mean short answer is yes um we are looking at because as a part of spti in addition as a last resort in addition to you know trying to increase our efficiency purchasing renewable energy we will have to look at credits as well to achieve our targets lovely and and are you already doing this or are you looking to get into this uh, in in the near future we are looking to get in, into the near future we haven't started yet got it fantastic um uh, prabha rajneesh if you would chime in please uh we believe in carbon uh, uh, carbon offset is the last resort uh, first right. first 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 we need to uh, we need to take the initiatives uh, uh, to adopt the renewable energy because because purchasing the carbon offset is 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 not a long term solutions got it uh prabha that's a perfect setting right because the conversation the last time we had is that unilever stands that we will not get into carbon offsetting and that we we'll look at active abatement and removing Uh, emissions uh, from the operation so would love to uh, for you to spend a little bit more on uh, that particular philosophy from a unilever standpoint so i think uh, venkat yeah that's absolutely the philosophy and i think it does go back to this idea of uh, i'm and i'm sorry i'm going to sound like a little bit like a stuck record and i've obviously worked for unilever a long time and the record is therefore a bit stuck but the whole idea of you know doing well by doing good uh, it does seem like we have the opportunity to be able to do this within our ecosystem ourselves and hence the targets that are out there and really the idea that there is enough idea uh, there are enough ideas out there which will allow us to find a technological answer to some of these because none of these are sitting low hanging fruit saying go out there and do it they are all going to require new fresh thinking uh, both from an i think for at all three levels firstly what is the idea itself secondly what is the ecosystem that's going to allow us to commercialize that idea and thirdly right. will policy and government then support that into making it viable uh, across the board so i think our feeling is that we do have the capability to be able to do something at all of these and so hopefully we can deliver this ourselves without uh, the offset uh, part fantastic uh, at least that's and, the current and... thinking so but it's an evolving space uh absolutely but even to for an organization that has set such ambitious targets and uh, backed it with uh, good action um to um, to take that philosophy and take the route uh, is is definitely inspiring uh, prabha and as far as uh, belaboring the point about doing well while doing good it's very much in line with uh, the theme for today so i'll i won't be the one to complain about it so feel free to mention it a few more times right um uh, sharika i want to kind of come back to you right and and you were indicating a little earlier about and this is also the point that uh, prabha was indicating a little bit earlier which is um for any organization and this is agnostic of the sector and the geographies that we uh, that that we operate in and that we that we kind of have an influence direct or indirectly um one of the things or one of the challenges of course is how do we work with the ecosystem partners right uh, both uh, part of our direct upstream and mainstream uh, supply chain partners but also the ones who are uh, indirectly uh, part of our value chains or ecosystems um and one of the challenges of course which um i think everyone across different sectors kind of agrees on uh, in in uh, you know setting and achieving net zero targets is the role that policy could potentially play right um and i remember us having a conversation about how subsidies around fossil fuels makes it a lot more difficult for us to act on some of our uh, ambitious targets uh, would would love for you to chime in on uh, on that particular aspect and how possibly mas is looking at um, 
working with these ecosystem partners, perhaps even the policy actors on how we can influence the uh, ecosystem towards making progress? Sure. So um, let me uh, sort of try, try to explain that. And I was putting my hand up uh, also because I was hoping to, to uh, also talk a little bit about the carbon credit before I get on to your question. Um, sure. I do agree with everybody that the carbon credits is definitely should be a last option. Uh, but some of the challenges is country-based, like you say, as we're going into the policy. Um, for example, in, in Sri Lanka, we don't have the possibility of purchasing renewable energy off the grid. Um, and our grid emissions factor is, you know, it's fluctuating and it's very difficult for us to maintain certain carbon commitments if we didn't look around that. And we talked about, um, and back, getting back to your question, um, Venkat, in terms of how do we um, work along, along the downs, you know, upstream and downstream. And it's very uh, difficult uh, thing in terms of policy and regulation and influencing uh, people. We, we are trying to get around um, lobbying with the government, um, I mean, as a group, to be able to have what you call a, a power wheeling agreement. So even MAS has invested significantly in renewable energy, but that just goes into our grid. It's not something that we can then uh, easily offset ourselves. Um, so there are challenges along that. Uh, in terms of influencing the um, supply chain, um, we do really want to make sure that there is a reward and recognition process for everybody along the, um, along the and, and certain targets that we are trying to work with our customers also, because we, as a manufacturer, we are sort of in between. Um, so trying to work very closely to, uh, to support them in achieving some of those targets through efficiencies and, and other, other ways. Um, I think, wait, did I answer your full question? You had some one part of your question. Did I, did I get that? Okay. Yeah, well, I, I think we, we also spoke uh, about the, I, I think I was referring to the conversation that we had a couple of days back um, about um, what are those specific policy interventions about subsidies on uh, fossil fuels, which makes fossil it a lot fuels, yeah. difficult, right? So would love for you to touch on that uh, very quickly, because I know it's something that that kind of is a, is a, is a pain point for uh, most of us in the audience. Yeah, I mean, it is what it is in the sense that right now it's very, everybody's in a bit of a tight spot because it's, uh, it's about having, uh, having the government or anybody else supporting, um, you know, sort of the positive way of, of doing things ideally, essentially, but, but the problem mm -hmm. that they have is unless a majority of the organizations are also willing to, it's sort of the timing of this, right, uh, which is quite challenging right now, if you take, uh, take what we would be paying on a subsidized uh, currently uh, electric, uh, electricity rate for, for uh, manufacturers, uh, for us to move into, uh, into renewable energy and to make that investment is a big hit. So, I mean, in, in terms of how, how, how does it make business sense? I think somebody had also talked about that chat. It doesn't really make sense like that to, to move into it. But essentially, we are seeing um, a lot of the larger companies still making that move. They realize that that is the future, and, and we have to do that, um, including MAS, many of the other parallel organizations, et cetera, are deciding that as large manufacturers, we need to make that move regardless of what the current uh, policy is, because we know that this would only be temporary. It's just a matter of time before uh, we don't think the subsidy can be held on forever. So that's sort of the movement we're seeing um, and hopefully will be recognized more for the renewable side and there'll be benefits uh, for that. Lovely. Thank you so much for uh, uh, delving onto that, uh, uh, Sharika. So I, I want to kind of move into, now that we have a good foundation on each of your organizations, the, your net zero strategies, what are some of the key pillars, what are some of the key dimensions and how you're looking at, or what are some of those meta principles that's driving your efforts uh, towards getting to uh, net zero emissions. And I want to shift to the conversation to the second part of the conversation where for the benefit of the audience, uh, mm -hmm. irrespective of which sector they're joining us from uh, or they're part of, um, I would love for each one of you to now um, help the audience understand what are some of the challenges that you face? And I think this is, uh, this is a point that uh, Rajneesh, you were indicating about, right? We clearly know that this is a very tough transition for most organizations and most sectors and most countries. 
Um, we know that the inertia is extremely strong. Uh, Rajneesh, you mentioned a very uh, important point about how critical it is for us to identify those low hanging fruit, uh, identify those first easy steps or the first small smart steps, right? Uh, Rajneesh, I want to start uh, this part of the segment with uh, from you um, and help us from a Shahi perspective, give us insights into what were some of those early challenges that you faced in setting those net zero targets or getting started on your net zero uh, uh, pathways? And uh, what are one or two ways in which you kind of address those challenges? So uh, there, uh, there are mainly two challenges. One is the uh, policies, government policies at inter and in intra-state level. We are located in nine states, different policies at each state. High cost of renewables. These are the only two challenges. And, and be, because we, uh, we, are complete, uh, we are not competing with the India market, we are competing with the global market. Yes, all these things are driven by the company owned things. And some of the states like Karnataka is having some favorable policies. This is the reason we had put our solar uh, uh, park into the Karnataka. And most of our, our factories are situated in Karnataka. But, uh, but, uh, but that case is not like in Haryana or Uttar Pradesh. You know. So one the, one the main challenge is the uh, policies, and and the second uh, challenge is uh, like like changing the government policies. You know the earlier government policies were very favorable to um, our, uh, renewable energy generators. For example, waiving up cross subsidy, billing and banking charges, incentives. Now slowly government has uh, is withdrawing all such benefit passed on to the um, RE generators, which will lead to the high RE power cost. For installing solar rooftop, the net metering um, tariff has been reduced by ESCOM. This is not favorable and feasible for setting up the plant. The captive power banking window is very short, which was earlier one year and now it is six months. With this, 100% RE utilization is not possible. Formalities and approvals are not favorable. For example, rental factories, like we are having some of the factories which is on the rent basis, like a lease basis. Uh, rental factories name changing to Shahi to avail uh, renewable energy also outsourcing from third party will will power is not possible for less than one megawatt contract demand factories shy is having eight percent of our total power consumption in such rental factories interstate wheeling of power is restricted due to which we are unable to balance the renewable energy, energy generations versus its utilization at other state where shy is having wheels and garments basic challenge in garment industry in space constraints for accommodated renewable energy alternatives and high capital investment, example, solar thermal concentrator for uh, replacing the fossil, uh, fossil fuel based thermal energy. A one TPS steam generation from coal needs approximately 100 square meter space, whereas solar thermal concentrator would have a footprint of 10,000 square meters. We have evaluated this solution, but it is not feasible due to the high investment approach. Payback is approximately 25 years. Sourcing of biomass for use in boilers is a challenge due to limited number of suppliers. Also, availability of biofuels is seasonal. Paddy has, though a very good uh, uh, biofuel, it is it's very difficult to source on a continual basis as this sector is not organized. Government should take initiative to organize the biofuel uh, sector by making favorable policies, incentive wise them, subsidize. And this will ensure sufficient and continual uh, supply of uh, biofuel across uh, demographics. So sure. these are the challenges. These are the basic challenges. Uh, even electricity storage, uh, our conversion of uh, HSD DG sets with retrofitting kit having gas-based solution is again a challenge where OEMS of DG sets are not taking any ownership for the guarantee and uh, running DGs with these fuel. So these are all the challenges, but it's still, but it's still, it's still, it's still, uh, it's still being, being, being. We need to retain in the market. We are competing with the global market, and of course, to save our natural resources, uh, uh, we are, uh, we are taking the ways and we are taking the decisions to, to, to move towards the renewable energy. And we are, uh, we are also planning to approach government for encouraging incentives and subsidies to the RE solutions. Lovely. Uh, Rajneesh, I'm actually going to come back to you and uh, with your permission, I'm going to uh, delve a little bit more uh, and probably look at the same question from a slightly different lens. Um, and uh, my submission is this, that 
We, of course, understand there are significant challenges from the restrictions that policy interventions and uh, uh, the current ecosystem uh, that puts on uh, each, each one of us as organizations on making any progress. Uh, but despite that, Shai has made credible progress, right? Be it in terms of solarization, be it in terms of all the other interventions that you were indicating early on in the conversation. Um, I, I would, I'll come back to you and I'll, 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 I want to go to Prabha first, but I want to leave you with a thought and I'll come back to you and pick on uh, that particular question is, um, if you could help us understand what are those challenges within the organization, right? Because a lot of times for, uh, and especially for all of those in the audience who are looking to either get started on the net zero pathway or to make, or those who have started but are looking to make credible progress, um, sometimes a lot of those answers lie within us, within our organizations, right? So there are, there are challenges that we face within our organizations in making, going from zero to one, right? So I want to come back to you uh, um, and uh, understand what were those internal challenges from a shy perspective. Uh, but of course, Prabha will, will want to kind of direct that question to you and understand. Um, we, of course, know those levers in terms of those funds that we were referring to earlier that be, that become such a huge motivation factor uh, for the business teams across Unilever. But could you also give us a lens into uh, some of the other challenges that you face in getting started on this net zero pathway within Unilever? So uh, I think that's an absolutely fantastic question. Uh, and I think I touched upon it earlier and as have many of the other speakers. I think the, the first challenge that we have honestly is that we know where we want to go. Uh, I'm not sure that we have the answers of how to get there. Uh, and I think the first thing is for us to really to find these technologies that will allow us to go from you know this fossil-based non-renewable uh, system, which is to one that is entirely uh, renewable. So that's really the first one and embedded within that one cup of course is going to be the fact that we're going to have to change the way we manufacture and the cost of doing that manufacturing as well. Uh, and therefore that entire end to end becomes quite important from an internal lens, which is the, the what are we gonna do and the how are we going to do it. In addition, of course, then we need all of our suppliers to move as well. So everybody who is an input into our process, they need to move and the, and the ingredients of the raw materials and the packaging materials that they give us needs to then conform as well. And therefore this entire ecosystem actually has to move. It's just, just adequate that we say that our own system uh, is net zero. Uh, and I think the third one really, and again, uh, I think Rajneesh touched upon it as well, is that we need an environment that allows these kind of things to become viable and more favorable. So a government policy that pushes in this direction. And I was reading somewhere that on the plus side, there is somebody has put an estimate of an $11 trillion opportunity for India to become more uh, you know, climate friendly and climate positive over the next, I think it was 50 years, if I remember correctly. Uh, and therefore, there, there's a huge pot sitting there at the end of that rainbow. Uh, and I think that if we can start moving the entire ecosystem, public policy in that direction, uh, there can be a share of that for, for everybody in this country, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, and, and I think uh, we, we, of course, understand that there's a significant role that the policy actors uh, in, in their different forms and shapes uh, <clears throat> in how they can actually enable all of us across different sectors and across different geographies uh, and not just towards uh, taking the right steps. Uh, and of course, you know, one of the instances, uh, for example, that uh, we've done at CIF over the last, in fact, uh, uh, last between 2019 and 20 is to work with the four different textile hubs. Uh, we partnered with the policy think tank um, and we took a bottom up approach. So we actually went to each of those uh, uh, states and regions. Uh, and I think it also goes back to the point that Rajneesh was making about how when you're operating across nine different states with nine different policies and laws and you know things that will really influence and affect uh, the way you want to do business or the way you want to change doing business. Um, we actually went to the ground and we worked with the local policy actors, right from the municipality to the ministries, the relevant ministries. We worked with the brands and the manufacturers uh, and we put together a list of key interventions from a policy standpoint that can be shaped to actually help the industry to make investments into a circular economy or circular solutions, right? Um, and the investments into uh, uh, renewable energy or Solar energy was one such uh, example. So 
what we did over you know one year and having done on ground workshops in four different textile large textile hubs across india was kind of tied back into a policy debrief document that is now sitting with two of the ministries right so totally understand on how we can influence and prabha this also goes back to uh, the conversation that we were having a couple of days back on how we can actually join forces as organizations within the ecosystem um, and how can we influence the policy actors to help uh, set the right enabling environment for us to do so happy to have those conversations with each of you and see how we can uh, collaborate on the front um, rajesh i want to come back to you and understand a little bit more like i i, I kind of left you with uh, before uh, before prabha is talk to us a little bit about those internal challenges and how you kind of came over those challenges because um, the the different perspective that i'm looking for is despite all those external challenges shahi has of course made credible progress so what are those insights that probably our audiences can pick from your experience uh in at least picking up the momentum from an, within the organization that is very good question uh, mr venkat because because it is all about the mindset which we believe uh, it is all about the mindset so so uh, if we talk about around 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 7 to 8 years back uh, now now sahi uh, shahi moves with the, uh, with the policies like people planet and the business so so uh, so this planet is in uh, it is always by uh, uh, it is always impacting the planet and people along with the business it's not like that uh, one can take a business alone uh, take a decision for the business alone and without considering the planet and uh, people so all three is we are we are moving to, uh, together and if we talk about the uh, internal challenges the mindset at the lower level if 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 you, if it, if the top level will start talking all these things giving the trainings giving giving the importance yes uh, switch off the lights first switch off the lights that is a very basic thing now now in shahi if you see uh, every every sieving table we are, we are having a hanging switch if operator leaves that table they can switch off the light so these are very 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 basic thing we have to start if if operator will uh, switch off the light in factory in, in office they will switch off the light at home also so uh, in another way we are educating them uh, we are educating them then then their children will also learn the same thing so that that kind of culture we had adopted in shahi so uh, you, with this with this this is reason we have we have a very big team from uh, from top management and there after the corporate environmental responsible then the unit responsible so all these things we keep on visiting at in the factories random basis taking the trial taking the interview of this uh, like sieving operator whether you have been trained for this uh, uh, how to use the energy um, how to how to use the water whether you need to close the tap or not all these things we are we are doing on very very basic uh, at at very basic level this is the reason we are able to uh, we are able to adopt this uh, this environmental uh, friendly culture so that is a uh, which which we believe without without uh, without having the uh, association or without having the support from our workers and our our lower labor we cannot win this race point very well made uh, rajneesh and uh, on a lighter note uh, if growing up uh, we had listened to all our parents uh, when they asked us to switch off the fans and lights when we left the room and if uh, everyone was not as thick headed and uh, slow like me i think we would have been in a very different world uh, but yeah absolutely i think sometimes it takes uh, some very small basic steps for us to uh, start making progress uh, prabha i see that you probably wanted to chime in here Yeah, actually, I just wanted to add. I think that uh, we find, uh, from an employer brand perspective, and also in terms of attracting the right kind of talent, uh, this is something that more and more people are actually looking for, and particularly the younger audience is certainly looking to see what your position is on some of these things. And uh, and I do think. to the point that rajnish is making there is a you need to take a set of people along with you but equally there's another set of people that are attracted to this and want to come work with you uh, in in this kind of space which i think is is really great and i do expect that this is 
as a personal thought, I think this is something that is going to continue to move because we also see it from a consumer lens and how much consumers are talking about, uh, you know, some of these areas. Thank you for uh, making that point, uh, Pravina. I think that's such a crucial point in terms of making and, and building that momentum within, uh, within uh, our uh, respective organizations. Um, I, I kind of want to switch to, um, and of course, there are several different pathways to get to net zero, right? I mean, there's no one way, and I think that's that's probably the beauty of the challenge. Um, and, and I actually want to spend a little bit more time uh, with each of you on um, the role that different pathways, the technologies, the solutions, and the innovations uh, are helping you and your organizations in making progress along this pathway. Uh, and the reason I want to do that is because one of the things that I've loved about this conversation and for what each one of your organizations is doing is to look beyond just offsetting and looking at active ways to either remove or avoid carbon emissions, right? So um, Sandeep, uh, this is where I would love to start with you and get your perspectives, given that fantastic program FLCDD that you're running um, and help us understand how what role uh, can technologies, innovations, and solutions play? We, of course, know that they play a significant role. But if you could help understand, uh, give us an understanding a little bit better on what are those different options, what are those different technologies, what are those different solutions that's really available out there for any organization which wants to actively avoid or remove emissions from their operations? Great, uh, Richard. Yes, uh, so as I'm uh, listening to the conversation, uh, we, you know, talking about the mindset, uh, and when we, you know, come out with that you know, innovative solution, we identify that, you know, startups, and we have to identify, you know, a site for doing this technology demonstration, uh, particularly the industry, because the nature of the, you know, uh, innovation is for, you know, meant for the industrial or commercial sector. One of the things we encounter is the mindset, because, Industries uh, conventionally have been used to you know, buying these you know, products which are available in the market. So for them to come around and understand you know, uh, innovation and you know, understand you know, the mindset of a startup itself is that you know, requires a uh, change in the mindset, the way you know, the companies, organizations are thinking. I mean, you know, the innovation needs to start from there, right? The, within the organization, it needs to percolate. Uh, the reason you are hearing about some companies are, you know, living where we are doing this technology demonstration because we see the, you know, uh, there there is an openness <clears throat> when we approach them to talk about these solutions uh, because uh, they are willing to, you know, try what what is out there uh, available at least in the Indian uh, context. Uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurs are trying to solve the problem for the industry. Any industry should be willing to come forward and you know take a look uh, rather than you know stepping back and uh, starting to ask you know uh, standard set of question that you know what is the ROI because you can't apply that template on and you know, innovation you know what you apply to it you know uh, normally commercially available you know product so that is where that you know that, that would be the first step uh, where you start looking at uh, uh, what is out there and you know we have. Uh, solutions on the waste heat recovery, but you know, even you know, uh, we ran the innovation challenge in the you know technology as uh, old uh, you know, which is like hundred year old like pumps, and we came across you know companies who have made modification in the pumps and you know, you know brought it to the level that is not available in the Indian market, and some of them are now going for you know commercial you know production. We all them would you know get you know uh, completed by the end of this year. So you know there will be a you know, uh, set of you know, product you know available. So there are ones who are the uh, the champions or the leaders who are willing to you know try out uh, these technologies uh, and you know uh, adopt them. The, they are the early adopters, and then the other ones would become the followers. So rather than you know, uh, of course the standard approach is looking for you know talking to the government policy adoption because you know everybody is operating in the real time environment where there are several challenges. Uh, one of the challenge would be to identify within the constraint, you know, what uh, what is needed. So 
uh, help if you could help us in defining the you know solutions or the challenges that you face for which you're looking for a solution. Uh, a program like you know, your videos can't you know, uh, come up with you know try to articulate the innovation and try to find that you know uh, entrepreneurs or startup who can bring those you know solution uh, to you. So we have been working in the area not only on the energy waste heat recovery farms, but last year uh, you know, we added you know topics of you know, industrial resource efficiency, uh, you know IoT. So whether you know we are talking about you know asking for you know the staff to switch out the light can you know. Uh, can a startup from you know one of the technical institute come up with you know IoT solution, uh, which can take care of these kind of things? We have a very fantastic startup in the you know from an IIT you know pass out of from an IIT Warangal. They are looking at you know uh, in the chemical reactors you know which speeds up the complete you know uh, chemical processes, and we are you know helping them to you know try it out uh, with you know two you know companies, one in Pune, one in Baroda. So, you know, if you are able to articulate those, you know, the challenges that you face for which you are looking for a solution, uh, more like a consortium like a, uh, approach where we have a you know, few like minded you know, industries who are willing to go forward, try it out, uh, you know, we can help them articulate and on one side, these you know, uh, articulation of the challenges that are for which you're looking for solutions, which you could you know, readily adopt. And of course, you know, it, it doesn't have to go through the conventional way. Uh, of you know going for the investment option where you know you're looking for a, you know a payback period of two or three years because innovation is innovation your real goal is for net zero so you cannot can apply the same template so you have to change that you know entire approach and mindset and you know uh, we can help in this finding those solutions so we are playing the role of you know intermediary you know helping us. Uh, to come up with this solution, and we have been able to, you know, find a number of solutions. So the amount of talent that is available in the country, we can you know, help to tap that and come up with this solution that can be really scaled up. So after all, when you know investors are looking at these startups which are you know successfully validated, you know they are looking at the market. So if the industries are not uh, still taking a very you know, conservative stand, you know it would be difficult for these startups to you know, scale up. I mean, you know, that is where the opportunity loss. Uh, so you know you end up you know buying a you know technology or product which is you know validated elsewhere outside the country whereas you can know, start up or you know provide you those solution at a fraction of the cost and you know it it works it's a more of a symbiotic relationship and that is the way uh, we see you know the uh, coming decade you know would be where you will see the you know, innovation so today morning uh, you know I was uh, on a, another very interesting event uh, that has done. Uh, get in the ring. Uh, it's uh, you know, organized by a Dutch firm, and we are looking at the startups and you know talking to them from the APAC region. Number of them were also from you know, India, uh, but then the companies are working for you know finding out uh, uh, you know uh, alternatives to you know uh, leather, which are you know coming from organic sources, plant-based you know uh, sources. You know developing uh, leather product. Uh, so you know. Uh, there is no limit to it. Uh, it's that you know you have to you know articulate and be willing to look what you know, what is out there and try it out and you know be part of the journey. Is what I would say. Yeah. So it's a journey. I mean, net zero is a, a long term goal, and you have to define you know your decadal goals to you know get there. So you know, first decadal goal is like by 2030 is to you know reduce you know significantly the emission reductions or uh, specific energy consumption for that you need to look at you know uh, the innovative technologies and that would help you to you know change the mindset and be proud to the next step uh, because you have exhausted all the options like investing into renewable energy technologies there's a limit to that and then you know truly the innovation is the next frontier right uh, couldn't agree more, uh, Sandeep. Thank you so much for that. And I think one of the things that we've, uh, you know, uh, you and Santosh and I have discussed multiple times um, over the past few months is how do we bridge the gap between the supply side and the demand side as far as innovations are concerned, right? So we all know and understand the credible work that the innovators are doing and that there are a lot of uh, offerings, a lot of options out there for organizations which have very serious intent and want to follow through with action. Um, and I want to get now, I want to kind of pose the question back to the brand representatives here, right? But 
before you um, you address the second point, uh, which which I'll articulate later, but uh, would want to kind of throw the question back to uh, uh, starting with Sharika, and talk to us and give us some insights on um, what are some of the solutions, technologies, innovations that you're leveraging um, on your net zero roadmap. Um, okay, Vinkitesh. When it comes to uh, when, when it comes to uh, the um, solutions, I mean, they're a little bit. Firstly, there are the fundamental things we had to get right. Um, so when it comes to our journey, I mean, there there is a lot of work that we've done in the past from getting the foundation right. Um, you talked about what are the biggest struggles. So I mean, even for us, from a baseline, when we looked at um, trying to make a full audit of what our emissions is. And, and one thing I must point out is for an organization starting to set up something, it's not an easy thing to do. You know, you've got to be able to have your baseline working. So once we've had our baseline to figure out even where all the sources of emissions are coming from, we've also started working a lot of things on, look, how can we um, reduce things like how do we change our architecture to have natural lighting? How do we make sure we change all of the, the basic fittings, the most obvious things that we need to do uh, with our transportation, our policies around the types of um, transportation we use for, for everybody. But when it comes to innovation, we're trying to look at down the supply chain, how do we um, invest more in, uh, in certain types of fabrics and materials, uh, in products. We're trying to have a product target that we've uh, self-imposed to see how can we reduce the amount of efficiency, uh, emissions by increasing uh, the entire efficiency of how we source. Um, so there isn't a specific big sort of innovation that we have gone for at this point because um, I mean like what one of the things that I was listening to the challenge with the innovations uh, is that either it's too small for the scale of an organization like ours in terms of moving into it or it's too expensive because it's way too sophisticated for an organization like ours so those have been sort of the challenges when trying to get that right balance when it comes to to innovation but um, so that's so we're working on on innovation when it comes to to process um, and in terms of making sure that we don't leave any of the easy things in terms of the actions on on the on you know leave it behind. Try to make sure that the most obvious ones are already met in terms of you know whether it's your air conditioning or you know in terms of uh, very basic things as well. Uh, the slightly more sophisticated the, uh, innovations, uh, such as moving on to climate neutral biomass. Uh, this is something that uh, we're working with. Um, I know even in India, you'd find it very difficult to source 40% of our energy sources come from biomass. So here, uh, the innovation is that we're trying to buy the climate neutral biomass um, and also trying to make sure that there is an aspect of um, of uh, employment that is created around this and transparency around this. So those are sort of the, the uh, slightly less tech type of innovations that we're looking at. Lovely. Thank you for uh, giving us a peek into your approach uh, as far as innovations are concerned, uh, Sharika. And I want to, uh, Prabha, I want to come back to you because of course you mentioned about the rainbow of uh, carbon colors. Um, and you spoke in the context of the, uh, the Clean Future Fund, uh, which kind of finances a lot of the, your research uh, work around uh, innovative technologies, but anything uh, else, any other angle that you would like to provide to us uh, from a Unilever perspective on uh, what are some of those innovations um, that are helping you uh, on this pathway? I think uh, Venkat, the, the purple carbon one, and you know, I, I, like I said, I've only moved into this job about a year and a half ago and heard about this, uh, we will take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use it in the process to make more ash, almost magical actually. So that one, uh, uh, I think is, is one of the ones that we're extremely proud of and the comment that Charika was making, it actually ticks all the boxes. It's viable, it has scale, and it creates real impact. And you know, uh, getting those kind of technologies, more of them would be certain Welcome. The second one, of course, is in the space of green carbon, which is this whole idea of biomass in alcohol into surfactants. Uh, that space, we think, is a, is a really rich space, particularly given an 
of course now we are nearing stubble burning season in india and that will become a conversation again but could that we have an alternate use is i think the kind of space that we are exploring uh, i must confess we don't have the answer as yet but there are some early indications that there could be an answer so that's the other space that we are really interested in but uh, the rainbow remains our primary focus <laughs> materials uh, could we then therefore lower our fossil fuel carbon usage fantastic um uh, rajneesh uh, want to get your final views on uh, some of the innovations or your approach and philosophy towards innovations and solutions that are helping you on this pathway from uh, a perspective of course see uh, for the renewable energy if we talk about the electricity we had already um, around 40 megawatt we are going to add till 2022 and if we talk about the thermal energy uh, we are we are in process to convert all our uh, uh, remaining boilers in, uh, from from hst to uh, from coal to this biomass so did, uh, this because thermal energy is is contributing around more than 70% of energy if we talk overall talk about the mills and the garment so that that contributes a lot uh, i'm talking about the coal coal based uh, boilers and along with that few nature based solutions for sustainability of net zero emissions the uh, you, uh, we have some more options but that is not uh, still feasible the coconut shell charcoal is also a good substitute for fossil fuel due to its high heat density it can be used in boilers to eliminate use of hst boilers uh, i study on use of heated nitrogen gas in place of steam as a thermal energy alternative for uh, heating and garment ironing application has been thought of a favorable outcome in this direction can be eliminate use of steam in finishing sections and will be a game changer with respect to reduction in ghg emissions if it happens will 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 uh, will be really happy uh, because steam is the main challenge in the in the garment industry and uh, carbon sequestration through uh, agroforestry in company owned lands in a proposal is the is in the pipeline so these uh, these four five points we are having uh, that uh, that we are really working hard to to, to adopt it but but our main priority is that uh, our boilers okay fantastic um we'll of course uh, uh, it's 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 never long enough to talk about innovations and how we can explore more and more options um now i, I want to kind of shift the conversation and open the floor um and one of the things that we we try to do as ecosystem enablers or transition brokers or uh, network governors, uh, if you may, is to democratize learning and kind of create opportunities where different organizations, different leaders, different practitioners within, outside, across different sectors can actually learn from each other, right? And of course, we've all been part of uh, such a fantastic conversation, but I want to open the floor to all of you. And if you had a question that you wanted to ask your fellow panelists, um, something that you want to dip into their insight and their experience um, that you could probably take back to your own organizations. What question would that be? And please feel free to go ahead and ask, uh, should you have such a question for your fellow panelists? Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, so Rajneesh, I know that we've been um, on that journey with biomass as you're moving from fossil fuels to biomass. It's very challenging. Um, and one of the, as you very rightly said, it's an unregulated market. So we are at the stage, and, and since you're also going on to it, that we are suggesting going with climate neutral biomass with complete transparency. Is this something also on your mind or how are you looking to secure that source of uh, biomass as you're going into that transition at this stage? You are very much correct, Sharika. Uh, we'll we'll go with the transparency only, and uh, and this is the reason. It is uh, of course we had started many of the our boilers where the biomass availability is very good. Many of our boilers has uh, furnace has been changed from coal to the biomass, but but many states where the biomass availability uh, and and if it yeah, and if you see the CV value of the biomass is not great um, uh, like coal in the moist conditions. All these things we are we are. Uh, Based on the state and based on the location, we are we are doing the study, and of course the tra the transparency is the first thing. 
because because we are we as our nation first believe on the transparency from where it comes from uh, uh, what is the origin of this one how it comes it's not like that in in uh, if you are situated in south and we are taking biomass from north in another way we are emitting the carbon so all these things all these things we are we are uh, we are always uh, considering while taking the, the decisions this is the reason it, it it is it is moving it is a journey it's a, it is not like that we can we can convert in one or two months or or in a year uh, alone so so it is a journey and step by step we are moving on lovely thank you uh, for that sharika and uh, rajneesh uh, any other questions in anyone's mind or perhaps uh, we can always keep this open ended so um, i will circle back to each one of you and if you have questions for your fellow panelists uh, let me know and i'm happy to play the messenger there um, and i want to kind of end with one open question to um, everyone or uh, sorry all of these speakers uh, at the panel but also to anyone who's there in the audience um probably almost to a fault uh, at intellicap uh, given the work that we do across different ecosystems and different sectors and different uh, dimensions of the development sector um, the the one all encompassing uh, driver for us is climate uh, change and energy right so if you had to think of one gnarly problem that you as an individual as a leader as an organization is trying to address and looking for a solution to um we are obsessed with trying to solve big problems that are worth solving so if you had a challenge or a problem for us that you would like to throw at us and we would like to come back and delight you with an answer um that probably helps you along your um along your uh, net zero targets or pathways what would those be um you can always reach out to me uh, if you can drop us a note for all of you in the audience um you know where to reach us uh, drop us a line if you have any further questions for the speakers and speakers with your permission i'll probably come back to you with a few questions that the audiences might have that have gone uh, unanswered so far uh, but we're at the end of the time um, just want to end with a big thank you to each one of you for making the time uh, it's been such a pleasure having a conversation um, clearly 90 minutes is never enough to have a conversation around net zero um uh, and uh, take it from me we will come back to each one of you and pick up and have a longer conversation on how we can collaborate across different aspects of a response to climate crisis we uh, can before we so close uh, there is a, a short question quick question from one of the audience i think uh, it's addressed to me so uh, it's about how do you see that technology landscape evolve towards supporting organizations to yes. net zero targets i think you know uh, since i've been working on my chance would be bias towards innovation and seeing you know innovations happening in india uh, you know and more and more as we go so i am optimistic uh, it's that you know organization have to also come forward to start adopting these you know you know uh, solution that is becoming available the challenge lies in you know bringing the you know supplier and the you know adopter or the user of these you know the solutions together because it's a large country and uh, there's so much is going on you know simultaneously so therefore you know having a conversation where you know we can bring the two sets together uh, understanding what the challenge the industry wants and you know bringing the uh, you know solution provider like you know innovations uh, that would work i mean can I, and you know more of that happens that will have a snowballing effect so you know you may not have the answer to everything but you know somebody would you know have that you know questions and somebody will provide an answer that will you know solve the problem yeah perfect no thank you so much for catching that uh, sandeep uh, and i've been blissfully ignorant about uh, a lot of the questions that's been happening on uh, the chat uh, i know prabha has a very hard stop she wants to catch a flight and we hope she catches a flight uh, but thank you so much everyone uh, and uh, such a pleasure we will connect back with you and uh, prabha safe travels thank you very much everybody bye bye thank you thank you bye, -bye. Thank you. bye. bye.